Hello and welcome to the Grove Church Podcast. I'm Charlie Lofton, the lead pastor there, and we are so glad that you're joining us. Whether you are a member and you're just catching up on a sermon that you missed or you're someone who's brand new, we are really glad that you are joining us. And if you are new in some way, and I know that a lot of people will do that, will listen to sermons first before they visit, I want you to know that we would love to meet you at any point. You can join us live in our services on Sunday, 9 and 1030, or our streaming service at 1030. Either way, we would love to be able to get to know you. And regardless of why you are here uh, listening to this sermon today, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, good morning. Hey, if you are new, I'm Charlie, uh, lead pastor here, and really glad that all of you are worshiping with us today. Uh, if you're online, uh, if you're in the room, if you're new, you've been around a while, really glad that you are here with us. And if you are new, We'd love to get to know you. Um, you can fill out the online card there, the QR code in front of you. You can come out to our Connect desk and meet some people. We, anyway, we would love to know that you were here. Any way that we can help you, please let us know. Uh, we are starting a new series today. We're going to be spending three weeks just kind of talking, refreshing, remembering, rehearsing. And for some of us, for the first time, just kind of hearing us kind of talk about what it is our kind of our mission here is at the church. Because I think any organization can be like this, but I think especially for churches, you can kind of just kind of think about church as like, why am I here? I'm here because you're supposed to go here. It is just, it is a routine. It's part of what you do. And, and, you, and you come and we, and we can lose a real sense of what it is that God has called us to. Like, what is our purpose? And so we're going to spend the next three weeks just kind of walking through step by step what it is, what we feel like is that it's kind of our mission as the Grove Church. And some of this, uh, you know, would kind of be telling some stories of kind of things that have happened over the years that kind of exemplify that. And there was this really cool thing that happened to me is actually a couple of years ago. And um, I serve on the board of a, of, a, of a college, national college ministry called STUMO. And with that, I have the opportunity to really kind of go to different places all over the country, kind of talk to students, and mostly kind of, mostly what I do is I spend time encouraging staff. Got a lot of kids on staff. I'm just going to put this out there. I say kids. I have kids that are 23 and 26. And so I recognize you guys in your 20s that you are full-grown adults, but yet, anyways, they got all these young, young women and men on staff that are in their 20s, and I get a lot of time just kind of encourage them about what it's like to kind of be in ministry, how to do it for the long haul. I just have a lot of great interactions with them. So two years ago, I am in Florida talking to a group of staff that are um, from campuses, actually out west, but they're at this um, summer project that they do in Orlando. And I'm, I'm talking to them, and uh, a young woman comes up to me, and she says, you probably don't know who I am. She introduces herself. And she said, I was a student at the U of A, and I came to the Grove Church, but I only came one time. And I'm like, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know if I like where this story is headed, but we'll just kind of let it play out and see what she has to say. So I only came one time. Some of my sorority sisters brought me, and I had never really been to church before. And, and while I was there, I heard you talk about the gospel. And I had never heard it put that way before. I don't think I'd ever understood it. And, and I heard what you said, and then I processed it with my friends a little bit later. And it was in that moment that I gave my life to Jesus Christ for the first time. So it was because of your church and what happened there that I gave my life to Jesus. And now this is eight years later. And I had never had no idea about this. And at the time, she was, she was serving as a college minister in, in Wyoming and now is in San Diego with her husband doing some different sorts of ministry out there and had been having incredible impact in Arizona and Colorado and now in California for the gospel and bringing the hope of Jesus. And I had no idea that we had played a role in her story, but because we had, not only had we changed, had the opportunity to see God change her life, but for God to use her to change countless other lives all over the University of Arkansas and out west. And this is part of what God has called us to. And really, I might would say it is the foundational piece of what God has called us to. And as we think about what it is 
God has called us to do and who it is that he has called us to be, I want us to start this kind of this three-week discussion with this statement that the Grove Church, the Grove Church reaches people with the gospel. That is what God has called us to do. There is a world out there that is in desperate need. There is a lot of hurt. There's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of brokenness. And people are looking for hope and answers a lot of different places. And what God has called us to do is to bring them the hope and life that comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus said it himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the life. He described eternal life as knowing God and knowing me, Jesus, your son, whom God had sent, that this is where life is. And if people want to have hope in this life or the next, they're going to find it through Jesus Christ. And at at the core of what it is that God has called us to do, he has called us to reach people who do not have Jesus to find him. And even beyond the people who may not know Jesus at all, there are the discouraged and the broken, the hurting, the people who have left church, the people who are leaving church, the people who are overwhelmed and are kind of starting to stray. We want to renew them with the gospel. We want, no matter who you are, to find life and hope in the gospel. Now, you may hear me say that, and what you think that I'm saying is, We want people to come here and hear either me or Mark say gospel things out loud. That the goal is for us to say things. And so if this is what the Grove needs to do, really the only person who has a job to do, by and large, is is me or Mark. But really, if we are going to be a community, a group of people that are bringing hope and life to our community, and then through that, ultimately the world, If we're going to do that, it is going to take a vibrant, loving, Christ-honoring community of us. It's going to take all of us. Every one of us has a role to play because people are looking for hope and life, and they're not going to find it in 30-minute sermons. They, by and large, are going to find it because they have been attracted to an incredible community of people. It is the people that brought them, brought her here. It is that friendship. It is that attractiveness to this friend group. They're like, you want to come to church with us? Sure. And sure, then through that, she got the opportunity. But it was people that drew her. And so we want to be the sort of community that that can draw people to the love of Jesus Christ. And there's a story in Acts chapter 2. It is one of my favorite stories, and the passage we're going to look at today is absolutely one of my favorite passages. It has had incredible impact on me personally. I speak on it fairly often because I think it is just this incredible, pivotal moment to help describe what a healthy church uh, Jesus community should look like. And so to set the context, Jesus has died on the cross. He is resurrected. He gathered his disciples together one last time and gave them what we call the Great Commission. He said, this is what you need to be about. You need to go everywhere and tell people about me. You need to help them find life in me, and then you need to teach them everything I taught you so that they can have hope in this life and the next. Go and do this, but first I want you to wait. I want you to wait, and um, then the Holy Spirit is going to come. When the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to have the power that you need to be able to accomplish this mission. So they are waiting, and what is now we refer to as the day of Pentecost happens, where the Holy Spirit comes on all of them. And they come out of this room, and they are now speaking and proclaiming the truth of God in languages they don't speak. And so now they're starting to draw a crowd, and there are all these people here from all over the world, and they're hearing these guys who don't speak their language, speaking in their language. And so it's loud, it's wild, it's chaotic. And there's a moment here that I think is hilarious. The Bible, you may think the Bible doesn't have humor, or maybe it's just me. I think there's funny stuff in the Bible. And so, so all this is happening, and, and they start to whisper amongst each other going like, I, I think these guys are drunk. Which to me, enough, that's funny enough, because I don't think that's what happens when you get drunk. I don't know that all of a sudden you can speak other languages. 
I don't, can you start speaking languages you don't know? Hey, I, I, I don't know French, but when I get drunk, I speak French. I don't think it works that way. But that's what they're thinking. How are they speaking these languages? They must be drunk. I don't, I don't understand. And so then Peter gets up. He's kind of the leader of the apostles. And he gets up and he kind of gathers everybody's attention. And then he says this. Hey, listen, we are not drunk. It's only 10. Which I... <laughs> Which I, maybe I'm reading it the wrong way. Maybe I'm saying it the wrong way, but I'm sorry. That's funny to me. It's funny to me. It's only 10, guys. Give us a minute. Um, but then he begins to say, actually, what's happened here is the fulfillment of this prophecy that the Holy Spirit is going to come in this way, and these things are going to happen, and all of this is because of Jesus. And it and, and begins to spread, talk, talk to them about who Jesus was, share the gospel with them. And it says that 3,000 people in that moment came to faith in Jesus. And so what was started is just a few dozen people that were following Jesus all of a sudden turns into this large movement. And at the end of Acts chapter 2, Luke, the author of Acts, kind of describes what this new community of believers was like. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So I have this description of this brand new group of people. They were from all over everywhere. They had some commonality in that most of them had a Jewish faith background. But they were from different parts of not just Israel, but from surrounding countries. They spoke different languages. They, they had different backgrounds, different socioeconomic statuses. The thing that they had in common was a new faith in Jesus Christ. And it says that they would spend time together. They would eat together. They would just love being around each other. They were very generous with each other, helping people who had need. They would, they would listen to what the apostles were teaching and were devoted to hearing and applying it. And they were just, they were loving well. They were learning well. They were, they were being generous. They were worshiping God. They were in the temples. It's like everywhere they were going, they were just living what seemed like a very vibrant life in community and connection with each other. And it says that because of that, every day people would find Jesus. That there was something so attractive about the community that they had that people just wanted to come and be near them. And when they would be near them, they would not only get to experience this loving community, but then they would then be curious, where is this coming from? And through that, they would have an opportunity to hear, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, to hear that hope is found in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And every day, people were being drawn and attracted to them. In the Grove Church, we reach people with the gospel. And if we are going to be a church that reaches people with the gospel, I believe that we need to be this sort of a community. This is not just simply about saying true things out loud and hope someone hears it. This is about us being the sorts of people that are attractive and that we are living lives with one another in such a way that is attractive to people, that the people out there who are looking for hope and purpose and answers and life will find it when they watch you, when they watch us, and they will be attracted and then ultimately hear the message of hope that comes from Jesus Christ. So we're just going to look briefly, just a few, what I think are just a few incredible qualities that this community has that I believe we need to make it a goal. Some of these things I think we do well, and some of these things I think we could be doing even better. And the first one is this. If we want to be a church that reaches people with the gospel, we do this first by being a loving community. It says they loved each other well. It seemed like they just... They just liked being together. 
They liked eating food together. It says they, were, they would do this, and they would do it with glad and sincere hearts. This was not something they, that was put on their to-do list. This was just part of life for them. And when they were together, they enjoyed being together. And there is something overwhelmingly attractive about that. Just having friends, but not just people that you can pal around with, but people that love you well. And when you need help, they are there for you. You've got purpose together. They're learning together. A really powerful community. And for those of you who have been around a while, you should understand that we are now reaching the beginning of school, and, and it is the time where Mark and I will spend the next several weeks beating you into submission until you finally agree that you need to get into a small group of some kind, that you need to come here and your participation here in the church is not just simply about Sunday morning attendance, but finding a group of people that you can call your people that I've got people who I know have my back and I've got their back and we love each other well. We're learning together. We're growing together. We're doing life together. We help each other. It It is a primary need that I believe that everyone has and your people are here even if you have not found them yet. So I encourage you, as we will for several weeks, to find that. And if you're having a difficult time, Mark really is your gateway for that. And we, we want to continue to create more and more places, more and more communities where people can find this. And we had an incredible opportunity to experience that this week. Some of you know this, some of you don't. We moved this week, and we moved. We've been living in the same house for about 11 years and just moved. We were never really planning on moving. Uh, we had an opportunity here to move Heidi's mom in with us, which has been great. And we bought a house with her together. So she can have her own space, but we can kind of love and take care of her. And so it has been an incredible opportunity. So this happened this week. And it is an overwhelming thing to have lived in a house for 11 years. I don't know how much stuff you think you can accumulate in 11 years, but I promise you, we can accumulate more. We can accumulate stuff in 11 years, and it's got to get all sorted through. It's got to get packed. It's got to get sent. It's got to get all these things. And it was an exhausting week, but at the same time, What we got to experience from our friends, from our community, was overwhelming. The amount of love and sweat and and service that we got to see over these last few days was incredible. And there's, I mean, I I could highlight quite a few things, but I'll just tell you a little bit about me. I feel like that my mind, the way that my mind works, is like a really well-organized computer file system. If you want to come up to me right now with no warning and say, I, let's talk about the, all of the Jesus imagery in the Harry Potter books. I'm ready. Have you seen the latest Star Wars show? How does it connect to the other side? I've got that file, and I could talk about it immediately. Or this thing that we did at Summer Seminar. They say, hey, will you come and talk about the book of Revelation? Okay, I haven't talked about that in a while. I had to dust off that file cabinet and find it. And say, oh, it, 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 it's it's all there, and I can I'm I'm ready I'm ready to talk about it. I can draw all the things on the board. Well organized file cabinet. My office, my garage, my car. The complete opposite of all of that. Chaotic. Insanity is what it is. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's insane. And so there's a point where all, all the boxes and everything were out of the garage, and all that was left was kind of the gardening stuff and the tools and everything. And it was just a chaotic mess. And I was looking at it, and I was about to cry. And I was like, I, this is going to take me, this is going to take me, this is going to take me all day because I'm going to have to spend four hours curled up in a little ball just crying about it. But I had two of my really good friends there with me, and I was like, I. And I just looked at him. I don't even, I don't even remember exactly what I said. One of, one of them is here, and he doesn't like attention. But anyway, I don't know what I said to him. I was just like, I just pointed at it, and I said, please. And they just swept up, and they threw away what needed to be thrown away, and they organized, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and in an hour, they accomplished what I don't know that I would have ever been able to accomplish. And then on the back end, a different guy came and did the exact same thing in the unpacking of it. Then I had another incredible guy order, organize all of the tubs and relay. Have you ever had a tub that you moved 17 times and it says, like for our house, it says, Maley's winter clothes, scratch, 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 Lauren's summer clothes, scratch, 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 cords and cables. 
right? So he went through every one of those tubs to see exactly what it had in it and relabeled all of them and organized them. I would have known that I needed to do that. And it would have been a bane of my existence every time I walked past it. It would have been like, I need to do that. I mean, but this story, he was, he, was, he was down there with joy listening to a podcast at an insanely fast rate and just loving life and did this for us. And those are just a handful of the stories of how well we were loved. But here's the thing. Also, several people, when they would come, they would take breaks and they would sit with my mother-in-law and they would just talk to her. At one point, she was card sharking somebody yesterday, which was wild, watching her dominate somebody in poker. I'm not even sure how this came about, but she was crushing this poor guy in poker. Anyways, whoop, and after it was all over with, she's like, you've got some great friends. You have a great church community. They showed a lot of love. It was attractive to her. And when we live life that way, it is attractive. It draws people. It draws people's hearts. And it draws people to the love that comes from the gospel. So we want to be a church. We want to be a church that reaches people. So we do this by being a loving community. We do this by being a generous community. I love backpack season. When we walk out there and we have all these backpacks that people are filling with school supplies to go to Leverett Elementary, a school in South Fayetteville that just has a higher number of people that are experiencing poverty. And because of that, we're able to take almost every year about 100 backpacks down there and just to overwhelm them and bless them. If you've not had a chance to do this, you still have a chance. Grab one of those tags. tells you the name, uh, the, uh, the, I mean, the grade of the kid, uh, the, the, the gender, and the supplies that they need for that. You grab a backpack, get all those supplies, put it, bring it back next Sunday. What a simple thing to do to be generous to the people around us. And when we are a generous people like that, it has a multiplying effect. Not only is it just in and of itself a good thing, it is just a good thing to help someone who needs help. Full stop. It's just a good thing. But not only that, it is a tangible way of telling these families, God's people love you. And that's attractive. And not just the people that receive the backpack but the people who are on staff there and hear about it. This church is a place that is generous with people with no strings attached. They just want to love and be generous. If we can be that sort of a church, it is attractive to people. I'm a big fan of our community care ministry, and they are constantly talking to people who need a little bit of help with rent, with utilities, just, a, just a, a place to stay for a night. And we, are, we have become known in, in the community of people who are struggling as a place that, that just offers help and love with very few questions and no strings attached. And as such, we get a lot more requests. And if you would love to be a part of that team, let me just give you a small commercial. Just please go to the growthchurch.org slash connect. Fill out that card and let us know. Go out to the connect desk. We would love people to be able to help with that because there is always, always more need and always more people to be able to just interact and love and just tangibly show generosity to people. But that sort of generosity, having that sort of reputation as being a generous church is very attractive, not only to the people in need, but just to the community. We want to be a place that is known for its generosity and love for the people of the community. And when we do that, we are attractive and people will be reached for the gospel. So if we're going to reach people with the gospel, we want to be a loving community. We want to be a generous community. And we also want to be a church that is committed to growth. Now, we're going to spend the entire sermon next week talking about this. But it's sitting here in the passage. It talked about one of the key aspects was that they were, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. So I didn't want to just blow past it and not mention it at all. But we're going to spend a lot of time because we're not just a civic organization that is trying to do good in the community. Those are, those are great. Love those sorts of things. But we are a, we are a church 
that our desire to love in a community comes from a heart and a passion and a love for God. And so we want to be committed not only to being reached with the gospel, but living a life that understands, well, 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 well now what? Because a lot of people are stuck. A lot of people are stuck. And they don't know how to get unstuck. And if they are surrounded with people who don't seem to be stuck, who are getting healthier, who are, whose character is improving, whose lives are, are starting just to shine a little bit. That is very attractive. Again, we're going to spend more time talking about it next week, but I'll just leave you with this. Being devoted to the teaching, this is more than just learning information. Being devoted to the apostles' teaching was not just learning, but living it. And we need to be people who have a commitment, a plan even, to kind of for our own spiritual growth. And we'll spend a lot more time talking about it next week. But again, if we're going to be an attractive community that is reaching people with the gospel, we are, we are loving well, we are being generous, we are growing. And finally this, by being a worshiping community, we see this all throughout here. Verse 42, they're committed to the teaching, to fellowship, to prayer. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Again, we are not just an organization that does good. We, at our core, we are committed to a love and relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And there is a world out there of people who are hopeless and don't know where to find hope and life and meaning. And there are a lot of people out there that are looking for hope and meaning and finding it or thinking they're finding it in a lot of different places. Political movements, social movements, certain activities, certain hobbies. They're looking for life and purpose and meaning and they're trying to fill this thing that they have in them, this need that they have for real purpose and hope and life that only comes from full connection with God through Jesus Christ. And while we want them to find us as a place that loves each other well, that is generous, we want first and foremost for them to find us as a place that is fully worshiping and loving God. That they can see at the core of who we are They're going to be attracted by all these different things, by generosity, by kindness, by experiences that they have. They're going to be attracted to all of that. But then when they really find us, what they will find is people whose hearts fully belong to God. And the way that we sing, the way that we live, the way that we talk, we are worshipers of who God is. Now, again, I want to make sure that you understand that we're going to be a church that is reaching people with the gospel. Everyone here has a role to play. You need to be loving in your community. You need to be generous in your community. You need to be committed to growth. You need to be, you and and your people need to be living a public-facing life that shows people the love and the hope that comes from Jesus Christ in you. You need to be the attracted, attractive ones who are drawing people to you. And they ultimately find community here. They ultimately hear Jesus here. But you, the way that you are living, who you are when you're here, who you are in your real lives out there, who you are, it is attractive. It is drawing people. And honestly, we need you here because right now there are, we are surrounded by people who are looking for this sort of community, who are here for the first time, who are here for the second or third time, and they're looking for that, and we need you to connect with them. And next week, there's going to be even more, more people that we've never seen before who are looking for hope and life and a powerful community, and I hope they meet you. And so we need you here not just simply to be a worshiper, 
but to be someone who can be attractive and help draw people to where real hope and life is found, which is in Jesus Christ. So two years ago, I got to meet this young woman in Florida, and then, and, then, and then this summer, I was back, same place, Orlando, same group of people, a little turnover. There's been some turnover in a couple of years, and there was a few more there, some people that I hadn't met. And this young man comes up to me. He says, hey, you probably don't know me, but I want to introduce myself. I'm like, okay. And he's like, yeah, I was a college student at the University of Arkansas. And there was one Sunday that my friends, I didn't want to do it, but they taught me into it. They brought me to church. And I came to your church, but I only came one time. And I'm like, man. (laughs) And I heard you share the gospel. It was the first time I'd ever heard it. And honestly, I was mad. I I I didn't like it. I didn't like what you said. But it became kind of an earworm for me. And I was processing it with my friends, and I just couldn't escape it. And finally, after a few days, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And now here he is in Arizona, giving his life that other college students might find hope in Jesus Christ. That's two stories. Each at the time I heard them, six, seven, eight years old, had no idea. We had one hour of impact and influence on two young kids when they were in college and had an impact on them that we had no idea about because of what God did in their life in that brief window. Not only did it bring hope to them, but it has had a multiplying effect in the lives of many, many other people. And those are two stories that probably, I I, I didn't think I would have, I probably would never have, I just, coincidence that I was able to find out, find out how many more stories are out there like that of people who just came one time for whatever reason but God did something significant in their life for people who maybe it was more than one we got to, we got to share the love of God with them for a couple of months six months a year a couple of years ten years thousands of people have experienced us over the last 15 years or so. And we have an opportunity every Sunday. And you have the opportunity every moment of your life to live in such a way that draws people to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And this is the kind of community He has called us to be. That through our love, our generosity, our growth, our worship, or bringing hope and life to a world that's desperate for it. Let me pray. God, I pray today would be a day in someone's story. Even if they end up at a different church, even if they move away soon, that today would be a day that for really for the first time they understood the significance of the gospel. That your son Jesus Christ died so their sins could be forgiven and they could have eternal life with you. God, I pray it will sit with them and they can't escape it and they'll find hope and life in you. And God, I pray that we would be a community that is attractive to people who are looking for hope in life. And that God, that we would live and love in such a way that people will see your son Jesus and then want to be a part of a community that worships and talks about him and that people can find hope in this life and the next through him. And it is in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us on our sermon podcast. And you can learn more about us at thegrovechurch.org. And if you go to thegrovechurch.org slash connect, there's a form you could fill out. Just let us know that you've been listening. And if you want to dig deeper on some of these topics that we cover in our sermon podcast or just in other 
issues of dealing with culture or theology, those kinds of things, uh, you can check out our Cultivate podcast, which is on the same feed, um, however you found this particular podcast. So again, this is Charlie, the lead pastor at The Grove, and thank you so much for joining us.